So what if the Confederacy won the American Civil War? Oh boy, this one, uh... This one's gonna get really spicy now, isn't it? So for those of you who don't know, the Civil War started because of uncompromising differences between the free and the slave states over the power of the national government to prohibit slavery in the territories that had not yet become states. Now, this may be a debate for some on whether the Civil War was in fact about states' rights or whether it was about slavery, but I'll be very honest, the reality is both and it is not a discussion for this video. You see, when Abraham Lincoln won the presidential election of 1860, he was the first Republican president on a platform that pledged to keep slavery out of the territories. Thus, seven slave states in the Deep South seceded and formed a new nation, the Confederate States of America. The initial seven of these were composed of South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. The incoming Lincoln administration refused to recognize the legitimacy of secession from the Union and tried to bring about a peaceful resolution, but it was fully prepared to utilize force to keep the nation together. They feared that it would damage democracy and create a fatal precedent of states leaving when they didn't get their way, and that it would eventually fragment the no longer United States into several small squabbling countries. After the seizure of Fort Sumter, Lincoln called out to militia forces in order to suppress this insurrection, and for 75,000 men to be raised for a period of three months. Four more slave states, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina, then seceded and joined the Confederacy with their own militia forces, having 100,000 men called up for a period of six months. Now, both sides entered the conflict anticipating a quick end to the fighting with their subsequent victories. On July 21st, 1861, people from Washington, D.C. trekked to the countryside near Manassas, Virginia, in order to watch the Union and Confederate forces clash in the first major battle of the American Civil War. Known in the North as the First Battle of Bull Run, and in the South as the First Battle of Manassas, the military engagement also earned the nickname the Picnic Battle because spectators quite literally showed up with sandwiches and opera glasses. These onlookers, who included a number of U.S. congressmen, expected a quick victory for the Union and a swift end to the war that had begun only three months earlier. But instead of an easy victory, a Confederate counterattack sent the still green Union forces into a panic, causing them to rout. Horrified, many of the onlookers fled as well. They and other Union politicians realized that this war was going to take longer than a mere three months. By the end of 1861, nearly a million armed men confronted each other along a line stretching 1,200 miles from Virginia to Missouri. And in addition, a blockade was set along the East Coast to choke the South into submission by cutting off its export capabilities and supplies. The real fighting, though, began in 1862, with massive battles like that at Shiloh in Tennessee, Gaines Mill, 2nd Manassas and Fredericksburg in Virginia, and Antietam in Maryland. These all foreshadowed an even bigger campaign and the battles that would come in subsequent years. From Gettysburg in Pennsylvania, to Vicksburg in the Mississippi, to Chickamauga and Atlanta in Georgia. For three long years, from 1862 to 1865, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia staved off invasions and attack by the Union Army of the Potomac, commanded by a series of rather ineffective generals, until Ulysses S. Grant came to Virginia from the Western Theater to become General-in-Chief of all Union armies in 1864. Now, by this time, the original Northern goal of a limited war to restore the Union had given way to a new strategy of total war, effectively to destroy the Old South and its basic institutions of slavery. Both sides grew weary, and the Union resolved itself to crush the South as quickly and as aggressively as possible. After a series of bloody battles, Grant finally brought Lee to bay at Appomattox in April of 1865. In the meantime, Union armies and river fleets in the slave states west of the Appalachian mountain chain won a series of victories over Confederate armies. Over the period of 1864 to 1865, General William Tecumseh Sherman led his army deep into the Confederate heartland of Georgia and South Carolina, destroying much of their economic infrastructure while General George Thomas virtually destroyed the Confederacy's Army of Tennessee at the Battle of Nashville. By the spring of 1865, all principal Confederate armies had surrendered, and when Union cavalry captured the fleeing Confederate president, Jefferson Davis, in Georgia on May 10, 1865, resistance effectively collapsed, and the war ended. What would follow would be a long and painful process of rebuilding a united nation free of slavery. 
But what if that wasn't the case? What if the Confederacy had actually won? What would the world look like? In order to really understand that question, we really need to go back and look at the beginning and compare the two sides and see how it is that we came to the point that we did in our timeline in the first place. I mean, there are many reasons why the Union initially believed that it would be a quick and easy victory. I mean, by all rights, the North dwarfed the South in almost every single capacity. Between the period of 1815 and 1861, the economy of the northern states was rapidly modernizing and diversifying. Although agriculture, mostly smaller farms that relied on free labor, remained the dominant sector in the north, industrialization had taken root there. Moreover, northerners had invested heavily in an expansive and varied transportation system that included things like canals, roads, steamboats, railroads, etc. It had financial industries such as banking and insurance, and also large communication networks that featured inexpensive, widely available newspapers, magazines, and books, along with things such as the telegraph. By contrast, the southern economy was primarily based on large farms, things called plantations, that produced commercial crops such as cotton, and these relied on slaves as the main labor force. The price of cotton, the South's primary export, had risen dramatically in the recent decades, leading to southern development primarily centering around agriculture and coining the term King Cotton. Approximately 21 million people lived in the North, compared with some 9 million in the South. And even among that population, around 4 million of that 9 million were slaves. This gave Union forces more than double the available manpower to fight. And in addition, the North had more than 100,000 manufacturing plants against something along the lines of 18,000 that were south of the Potomac River. And more than 70% of the railroads connecting all these were in the Union. But the thing is, even that statistic is misleading. In the 1860s, the North manufactured 97% of the country's firearms, 96% of its railroad locomotives, and 94% of its cloth, 93% of its pig iron, and even 90% of simple items such as boots and shoes. Almost all of the principal ingredients of gunpowder were imported. Since the North controlled the Navy, the seas were in the hands of the Union. A blockade would eventually suffocate the South. And that is merely on the resource side of things. If you look at the politics, the Union also had a functioning government and institutions, as well as a small but efficient regular army and navy. The South, on the other hand, was a newly created entity in rebellion without a fully formed government or army, for that matter. Unlike the American Revolution almost a hundred years earlier, the enemy was not thousands of miles away and slow to respond. This time, the enemy would be right on the rebels' doorsteps, and also with vastly more immediately available resources. Still, the Confederacy was not without resources and willpower, and there are key reasons why the war did last as long as it did. The South could theoretically, mind you, produce all the food that it needed, though admittedly, transporting said food to the soldiers as well as civilians was a major problem. The South also had a great number of trained officers, as seven of the eight military colleges in the country were in fact in the South, giving them a much stronger martial tradition. And even despite the deficiencies, the South had proven to be very resourceful. By the end of the war, it had established armories and foundries in several states. They built huge gunpowder mills, melted down thousands of church and plantation bells for bronze, and generally did their best in order to supply themselves. The greatest strength of the South lay in the fact that they were fighting on the defensive in their own territory. They were familiar with the landscape, they could harass northern invaders, and they could hold out, really, so long as supplies lasted. And that is where the start of this hypothetical really begins. Supply. You see, in a war of attrition, the Union obviously has the overwhelming advantage that it could produce more goods, arm more men, and replace them as casualties mounted. By the later half of the war, agriculture was suffering in the South as farms and plantations were neglected when men left home in order to fulfill their military obligations to the Confederacy. As the years dragged on, both civilians and soldiers in the South suffered greatly. The Union blockade of southern ports only added to the shortages. And so with the plantation economy in shambles and inflation out of control, the price of simple things such as food was beyond the reach of many ordinary citizens. An example of this runaway inflation was the increase in the price of flour in Richmond, Virginia, which was $20 a barrel in January of 1863, and it had risen only 14 months later to $250. By 1864, soldiers' rations had been drastically reduced, 
and hungry soldiers suffered from night blindness, dysentery, depression. Many had to become experts at foraging for food and learning to simply deal with hunger. Desertion became commonplace, and the Confederates were simply not able to replace their numbers, both in terms of the men who deserted, and simultaneously in just feeding them in the first place. And so in our timeline, Union General Ulysses S. Grant had used these overwhelming number advantages in order to trap and overwhelm Confederate General Robert E. Lee in a series of battles the Confederates simply could not replenish their men from until they capitulated. So in order for a Confederate victory to happen, one of two things really needs to occur. Either the supply issues need to not be a thing in the first place, or the Union will need to be knocked out of the war more quickly. And for all the reasons that were previously listed, that first example is unlikely, if not impossible. Manufacturing deficits, agricultural neglect, a strangling blockade, all of these things would have been what contributed to an exceptionally difficult thing that more than likely could not be overcome. Which brings us to the second option, knocking the Union out of the war quicker. In order for the Confederacy to emerge victorious, they would need to forego much of the defensive advantage that they had on the home front and move to attack. And so why, you may wonder, why attack? Well, the answer is morale. You see, in our timeline, the Civil War was not a popular one in the North. Opinions in many states were often mixed with different groups, such as the Copperheads, which were Northern Democrats that advocated for peace, leading some of the greatest amount of political resistance. Many everyday people resented the idea of using force in order to maintain the Union, and even more so when the fight changed after the Emancipation Proclamation to be about slavery. The worst offense for many, however, was the conscription. I mean, it became very obvious quite quickly that the volunteer enlistments were inadequate to cope with the demands of war that simply had no end in sight. The President and Congress resorted in August of 1862 to a draft law that proved only minorly effective, but it aroused a great deal of resentment over its exemption clauses and over the fact that draftees who had money could simply hire substitutes to serve in their stead. Corrupt manipulation of the system by doctors who provided untruthful medical certificates, draft officials who could be bribed, and also professional substitutes would simply sell themselves as draft substitutes several times, employing fake names and then deserting only to later re-enlist and get paid again. These problems were widespread. And thus, the poor were drafted into a war that they could not pay their way out of, and immigrants were forced into a war for a country that they had only recently come to and did not really consider it theirs yet. These circumstances led to draft riots in our timeline across New York that had to be put down with military force killing many. In order to bring the Union to the negotiation table, they would need to be bloodied and shocked into submission. And mind you, this could have occurred at Bull Run. As I said earlier, in our timeline, the First Battle of Bull Run, also known as the Battle of Manassas, marked the first major land battle of the American Civil War. On July 21st, 1861, Union and Confederate armies clashed near Manassas Junction, Virginia. The engagement began when about 35,000 Union troops marched from the federal capital in Washington, D.C., in order to strike a Confederate force of around 20,000 along a small river known as Bull Run. After fighting on the defensive for most of the day, the rebels rallied and were able to break the Union right flank, sending the Federals into a chaotic retreat towards Washington, whose roads were then clogged by fleeing civilians who had come to watch the battle. And so despite their victory, Confederate troops were far too disorganized to press their advantage and pursue the retreating Yankees, much to the anger of President Davis. The Yankees then reached Washington only 27 miles away by July 22nd. The First Battle of Bull Run cost some 3,000 Union casualties compared to around 1,700 for the Confederates. So in our new timeline, the Confederates do not simply win the Battle of Bull Run. They crush the Union forces. Now, there's many ways that something like this can happen, but we can simply mark it off or explain it away as better judgment from commanders on the ground, more accurate shots from individual soldiers, or that instead of each side only committing around half their soldiers as they did in our timeline, the Confederates commit their full force in a massive counterattack. The Union, in this case, perhaps suffers more than 5,000 initial casualties versus 1,000 Confederates, with the fighting ended quicker. With less casualties and better organization, the Confederates are then able to capitalize on their crushing victory and launch a pursuit of the fleeing Federals. In our timeline, many of these Union soldiers that were on the run had simply 
abandoned their weapons as they ran, prioritizing speed more than anything else. With an even more crushing defeat, this amount is even greater, giving the men little ability to defend themselves in the confusion from their pursuers. Few, if any, are able to make it back to Washington, as the Confederate cavalry moves off to cut their retreat. And so with their retreat cut off, the commander of the Union Army, Irvin McDowell, is captured, along with several members of his senior staff. The remainder of his forces surrounding him also surrender. Many thousands of men are taken prisoner, along with a number of influential senators and other politicians, who had come to the battlefield to watch their supposed great victory. With the Army of the North captured, no immediate news makes it back to Washington, where Lincoln and his cabinet await news of their perceived victory. By the time that straggling soldiers and a few escaped senators make it back, the Confederates are already hot on their tail. An attempt is made to break out and to get the president to safety, but pursuing Confederate cavalry are able to capture Lincoln, as well as members of his cabinet, much in the same way as Confederate President Jefferson Davis was caught in 1865 in our timeline. With little forward notice, there was simply not enough time to get away, or get away far enough from Washington. A halt is called and the Confederates make no further advances into Northern Territory, instead issuing a declaration of a desire to begin peace talks. Britain then helps to serve as a mediator, its desire for Southern cotton urging the Union to make peace. For the Union, it's nothing less than an utter catastrophe. With the majority of its army captured, a number of senators, and the president, as well as all senior officials held hostage, there really is little that can be done except come to the negotiation table. After weeks, or possibly even months of deliberation, a peace is agreed upon. The deliberation in this case comes not from ceding of Northern Territory to the Confederates, that was never a desire for the Southern expansionists. Instead, westward space and expansion is guaranteed, with New Mexico Territory ceded along with Southern California to form a new state and a 12th member of the Confederacy. Something that in our timeline was impossible, as the Southerners who wished to secede in California were quashed very early into the war. What is created is an almost clean, straight border that would run from Virginia all the way down to Tennessee and then across to the Pacific, dramatically opening up plantation opportunities in this more suitable agricultural environment. And so you might wonder, a clean line though? Straight? A lot of these alternate history videos typically include things like Maryland and Kentucky also in the New Confederacy. But what about them? There was genuine fear in the North of secessionist elements in Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland. If Kentucky, the birthplace of Abraham Lincoln, had also seceded, then this would have been a bigger blow to Northern morale. The reality of it, though, is no matter what you see in these alt history videos, that's not very likely. Although there were many in Kentucky that sympathized with the Confederacy and saw themselves as Southern, they also saw themselves as irrevocably tied to the North. Kentucky's economy depended heavily on Northern trade. In 1860, ferries from Cincinnati, Ohio, made over 1,000 weekly crossings to Kentucky, while New York alone bought over 20,000 hogshead of Kentucky tobacco. The state's southern trade wasn't nearly as active. Kentuckians strongly disagreed with the South's anti-tariff policy, valuing manufacturing more than most southern states. And with a victory being achieved by the South so early into the war, the Emancipation Proclamation being issued later in the war in our timeline simply doesn't happen, there's no incentive to drive the border slave states into the Confederacy. The real question in this case is West Virginia. You see, West Virginia was actually once part of Virginia itself, having seceded from Virginia in order to join the Union in 1863, as the majority of people that were living in the Northwest of it were actually pro-Union, not secessionist. With a Confederate victory, these sentiments would still likely remain, and would more than likely result in these counties also ceding to secede from Virginia still. And honestly, in that case, more than likely West Virginia would simply be allowed to go. While an immediate division of territory is undesirable, it would be astronomically worse for a state that supposedly championed states' rights and secession suddenly did not allow someone to secede. The optics of that would have been terrible and led to deep mistrust between the states over whether or not they also would have been allowed to secede should anything go wrong. And so without a long-lasting war, neither side really sees large amounts of destruction. The southern plantation systems remain intact, although there is not nearly as much of a need anymore, industry does take greater root in the south over time. Not enough, mind you, to compete with the north, however. And with the conflict over so quickly, there's not nearly as much hatred between the two sides. 
Trade reverts back to almost what it was before, the South producing most of the base agricultural and raw goods, which would then be manufactured in the North for resale, albeit at a lesser scale due to tariffs that are passed in order to protect the trades of these two now separate countries. And as for what comes after, we actually do have an idea of this, one that is often repeated in alternate history videos about this same setting. Invading Mexico and the creation of the Golden Circle. Now, the Golden Circle, for those of you who are unaware, was the plan in which Confederate forces were going to take over Mexico, the Caribbean islands, and the northern parts of South America. These regions, which were perfect for plantation lifestyles, would theoretically allow the South to continue its slavery lifestyle indefinitely, in a position of supreme power. For you see, the Confederate Constitution included the right to expand, and the Confederate President, Jefferson Davis, filled his cabinet with men who thought very similarly. He even hinted that the slave trade could be revived in new acquisitions to be made south of the Rio Grande. During the American Civil War, Confederate agents had attempted to destabilize Mexico so that its territories would be easy to snatch up after the war. One rebel emissary to Mexico City, a man by the name of John T. Pickett, secretly fomented rebellion in several Mexican provinces, all of which ended in failure. But fate would deal the South a better hand in 1863. For you see, French Emperor Napoleon III seized Mexico, and that move provided the South with a perfect excuse to liberate the country after the Civil War. But with the North able to potentially stab them in the back should the Confederacy wage a war with a European power, it's far more likely in the scenario that the new Confederate States of America would instead seek a kind of compromise and alliance with the French, dividing Mexico between the two entities. Doing so would be mutually beneficial for both parties, at least in the short term. On one hand, the Confederacy would gain a European ally and easy acquisition of territory. On the other, it would limit their expansion for future generations. For the French, the deal would have been beneficial as it would have given them an American backer in the region, reducing the likelihood of another power being able to interfere in exchange for nothing more than a bit of territory. And so, assuming that this happens, things remain relatively peaceful for the next decade or so. But then the Franco-Prussian War breaks out in 1870, and France, well, they got humiliated. Any control over French colonies and overseas territory simply evaporates, and the Confederates use this opportunity to seize the remainder of Mexico. Over the course of the next few decades, the Confederacy would gradually extend its reach into the northern parts of South America, claiming more and more territory. The rapid expansion would deeply worry the Union, who would begin to supply rebels, slaves, and resistance groups in the varying states fighting the CSA or inside it. Among these groups would be increasing number of abolitionists that would slowly grow over time as they saw the Union developing at a far more rapid rate than they themselves and slavery as a shackle that was holding them back. A secret alliance would also be formed with Spain for the purpose of mutual protection in the area. Then, in 1898, or earlier, the Spanish-American War would kick off. Not the war of our timeline, mind you, but it would still bear arguably the same name. One of the many ships that would be taking raw materials from southern plantations to Europe would hit a mine, be torpedoed, or suffer some kind of accident off the coast of Spanish Cuba. The CSA would then use this opportunity to declare a war from this Spanish aggression and launch strikes in the Caribbean to seize Spanish colonies. And that is where the Union takes its opportunity to strike. In the three decades following the First American Civil War, the North had continued to rapidly industrialize. At the beginning of the First War, the difference was a large one. But by the time of the Second American Civil War, as it would come to be called, these differences were overwhelming. Over the years, the South had built more manufactories, but it had done so out of necessity to supply its war efforts and expansion. With the way that its economic system was set up, the majority of its arms and manufactured goods were still imported. Slavery, though horribly inefficient in comparison to industrialized machinery, was still the norm. Thus, by the time that war breaks out between the North and South once again, the quality of armaments was simply miles apart. I mean, we are talking machine guns, advanced artillery, repeating firearms. All of these are standard by this point in time in industrialized societies, and the North was producing them by the boatload. The devastating loss of the First War would have changed the Northern outlook on the military. New officer schools were going to be built in the North, and funding would be directed towards the Federal Army. The Navy had already been larger than the South, 
but over time would have expanded and advanced rapidly over the years in order to protect against a potential Confederate European alliance. Thus, when the Confederates strike at Cuba, the Union launches a surprise attack with a three-pronged strike. Rapidly moving down the Mississippi River, one army cuts the South in half. The second moves along the eastern coast in rapid order, defeating the much smaller and ill-equipped militia regiments that are raised against it. The capital of Richmond, Virginia is quickly seized, and the Confederate government flees to Mexico. The Confederate Navy is quickly crushed and driven back into their ports as a blockade is set in place, cutting off many of the Confederate colonies and holdings from reaching each other. Seeking assistance from overseas, Confederate diplomats reach out to the United Kingdom, but to no avail. During the First Civil War, the UK was already hesitant to support the South in the first place because of slavery, though they were more than happy to purchase the cotton that came from it. By the time of the Second Civil War, though, Britain was the dominant force fighting slavery across the world, and thus refuses any assistance to these southern planter slavers. In a complete reversal of fortune, in one fell swoop, the South is crushed. The CSA's government is dismantled in most of North America, and the Union is restored. Collaborative governments under abolitionist sympathizers are set up in states, much to the anger of large swaths of the population. The Caribbean and northern South American colonies are returned to Spain as compensation for the war, although their control over this territory would likely be limited, and probably not last. What was the grand empire of the Confederate States of America is now reduced to little more than the borders of modern-day Mexico, a bitter rump state of what was once an extensive empire. Its population had largely fluctuated over the years due to influxes of white settlers and black slaves, leading to a mixed population shocked after the decisive defeat of the war. What would follow would be a series of bloody revolts and revolutions plunging the state into chaos. The result of which, honestly, I cannot say. And that is where we will end things here today. Truthfully, at this point, that was a very fantastical ending, one of which was probably one of hundreds, if not thousands of different possibilities that could have happened. But before we get off into even more crazy territory in directions that I don't know where they will end, I think that it is time to end things here today. Thank you everyone for watching. My name is Takuyi. If there's anything that you would like to see from me, make sure to put it in the comments below, subscribe, hit the bell button for notifications, and I will see you all next time. Thank you everyone. Goodbye.